And Memes asks, is binary the most effective form of computation? Uh, well, first, let's explain what that is. When we talk about numbers, we're usually writing numbers in base 10, which means you know we have the ones column, the tens column, the hundreds column, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sort of the purer form of numbers that are easier, it's easier to implement in electric circuits is binary, where instead of writing things as ones, tens, hundreds, et cetera, you're writing them as ones, twos, fours, two squared, eights, sixteens, and so on. You're writing just ones and zeros, and a sequence of ones and zeros are being used to represent numbers. And in a computer memory, it's convenient to just have, well, there's either kind of a bunch of electrons somewhere or there isn't, and that represents either a one or a zero. It's like 100,000 electrons represent a, a, a one, and no electrons represents a zero, roughly. It's actually usually, usually not set up quite that way. It's usually set up so that, well, in, in the end, you sort of balance it so that you're not dealing with oh, there are electrons or there aren't electrons. It's kind of like there is one pattern of electrons or another pattern of electrons, at least across a series of, of bits like that. But in any case, that's that's the way. So for computers, it's just convenient to have sort of the presence or absence of voltage, current, electrons, whatever, represent things. Um, but you know, by the time you've built up to the level of even a machine code, let alone a sort of a, a low-level language or or operating system or whatever else, you've you've long ago kind of abstracted away those issues. And you're really just dealing with, oh, there's a block of, of bits that represent a number. Now, you know, is it best to represent numbers in the end as ones and zeros? Well, it's been convenient for digital electronics. People have tried doing things like ternary, where you have basic, well, essentially base three, but it's usually one minus one and zero. And that has some conveniences. There were a bunch of Russian computers actually back in the day that used uh, ternary representation. Um, they, they didn't go fantastically. And I think in the end, by the time you've got all these layers of software built up, the details of what happens at the lowest level really don't matter much. The details of whether you have this instruction or that instruction and that detail, that other detail in the machine code of your computer, it's just not really relevant. It's just you, it's a, it's a small sort of layer above that. And then you're getting to things which are, can be sort of the same across all these different machines. Now, the question of whether even representing things in terms of bits is a good way to think about computation, that's an interesting question too. Because usually in a computer, we have, well, we're storing things at particular locations in memory. The, the locations in memory of a computer are numbered. And so you can represent them by a number. You say, I've got this location. It's 2 billion, 700 million, blah, 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 blah. At that location, I'm going to stick this thing that I'm storing, which might be, you know, the, the pixel on the nose of the cat in the cat image that I have, or something like this, is stuck at that particular location in memory. And those locations in memory are numbered. And so that and those those numbers that represent the locations in memory can be represented in binary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very kind of numbers-oriented way of thinking about things, that you're laying out the memory in sequence, one, two, three, four, five, memory locations, so to speak. Um, is that necessary? Well, no, it isn't. You can imagine quite different ways to do things. For example, neural nets store information in a way that isn't kind of numbered memory locations. It's a big mess, actually. It's the, the information is stored in these weights of connecting sort of one artificial neuron to another. It's a big tangle of stuff. And um, there are other cases in which you can think about things in terms not where sort of the lowest level operation does not have to do with things laid out in numerical locations in memory. So for example, if you're dealing with symbolic expressions, things where, well, you start off with things like an algebraic expression like x plus one times x minus one or something, but you can generalize that as we do in modern language to sort of represent any kind of thing, whether it's a, uh, a chemical or whether it's a, a piece of graphics or user interface, all those kinds of things can be represented as symbolic expressions, kind of like a function. The function might be the function that represents, I don't know, a slider 
and then that's combined into other things that represent other pieces of user interface. That whole thing, sort of function and arguments of the function, that whole thing is kind of the symbolic representation of pretty much anything you want. And that sort of unification that anything can be represented in that kind of symbolic way, that's a core piece of Wolfram language. That's sort of a big idea that I kind of uh, understood back in probably 1979 that you could really represent all these things with sort of human level computation in this symbolic way. But in any case, you can also imagine doing computation just in terms of these symbolic expressions. They're kind of like trees in computer memory. They're not like things where you label one, two, three, four, five location. They're really things that are more like this is connected, that is connected to that. So that's a quite different way to do computation. If you are really into our physics project, the thing that we see as being the underlying infrastructure for everything in the universe, space and everything in it, is hypergraphs, kind of graphs that just say, this is connected to that, or hypergraphs where you can say, this and this and this are all connected, and so on. And um, in, in, that, in those terms, sort of computation becomes the story of rewriting hypergraphs. If you've got a little piece of graph that looks like this, it's going to get rewritten into a piece of graph that looks like that. You can imagine a sort of infrastructure for computation that has nothing to do with numbers and positions in memory and all those kinds of things. It's instead, it's a pure story of hypergraphs and the rewriting of hypergraphs. And that's probably how our universe works or a view, one view of how our universe works. And yes, you can imagine that as well. And in fact, there are a bunch of people and companies that are trying to pursue kind of thinking about computation in terms of hypergraphs, because it's actually a very powerful and very flexible way to be the underlying structure of computation. Uh, so really right now, there are sort of, there's the uh, sort of things laid out in numerical positions and memory idea, random access memory, that's typical in most computers. There's, kind of the neural network model of computation where it's all these connections and so on. There's the hypergraph model of computation. There's the symbolic expression model of computation. They're all different types of things. What one should build hardware to do is an interesting question. I mean, there's some effort to build hardware that directly emulates neural networks. Uh, biology certainly seems to have things like that, but one can imagine doing that with digital electronics as well. There are efforts to do that kind of thing with symbolic expressions and so on. That's an interesting direction, and it's it's sort of a you end up with a different architecture of computer than the traditional one. And by the way, when people do what they talk about as quantum computing, but we don't have to know about sort of the 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 true sort of many branches of history quantum mechanics. Instead, we can just think of it as being well, let's make a computer out of something other than electrons and a semiconductor. Let's make a computer out of uh, I don't know, cold atoms or something, or let's make a computer out of optical kinds of things with light, things like this. And some of those other sort of models of hardware models of computation lead one maybe to, although that hasn't really been the, the thrust of what people have done, but some of those things could lead one to sort of different interpretations of what the underlying stuff of computation should be. I mean, there's a, there's a class of quantum computers that really have to do with and I, I say quantum computers a little bit um, uh, kind of reluctantly because I'm not sure that it's not really the quantum aspect of it that I'm emphasizing. It's just the the differently differently physics computers, so to speak. But there's a class of those where the idea is that you're trying to set things up so that, well, okay, so if you have a bunch of, I don't know, molecules bouncing around, for example, and you cool them down enough, they become solid, they form a crystal. Well, so that crystal typically has a rather simple structure. The molecules are lined up in a very specific way, but somehow it had to find that way of lining things up. Just as it cooled down, the molecules were bouncing around and they, they were kind of bumping up against each other. And somehow they, they found that, oh yeah, if I line up this way, I end up with the lowest energy state. Well, you can set things up so that the thing that you end up finding is the, the lowest energy state sort of solves a problem. It, it solves a problem of, well, how do you uh, arrange, sort of how do you get the shortest path from here to there? You can end up with problems like that being encoded in what the, what the lowest energy state of this pattern of objects with certain shapes is. And so that's an example of a kind of a way of doing computation, just have all these weird shapes and cool them down and see what pattern 
they form, that's a different form of computation than the traditional one that we have in computers. And it leads to different things being easy, so to speak, to do. Um, and although in the end, this principle of computational equivalence and the whole idea of universal computation tells you that in the end, it's not going to matter. In the end, both of these things are going to be equivalent in the computations they can do, although particular computations may be much more efficient on one than on the other.